Our next presenter is Dr. Robert Pacifici. Uh, Robert Pacifici is the Chief Scientific Officer at CHGI Foundation. If you haven't heard of it, it's a private, not-for-profit research organization that works with an international network of scientists to accelerate therapeutics for Huntington's disease. They have offices in Los Angeles, where Robert is based, as well as in New York City and Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, Robert joined CHCI Foundation in 2004. Before that, he was the site director and the chief scientific officer at the Research Triangle Park Laboratories of Eli Lilly and Company. Prior to joining Eli Lilly, Robert was the vice president of discovery technologies at, at Zenor, Zencore, or Zencore, a privately held uh, biotechnology company that applied rational design principles to the development of protein therapeutics. Before that, uh, Robert was at Amgen for nearly 10 years, where he held positions of increasing responsibilities, including leadership for their automation, high throughput screening. Um, he's a drug hunter, and he's probably the, uh, the leading HD drug hunter representing uh, around the world, representing hundreds of scientists around the world that CHGI helps to support. And so um, when Robert is not traveling the world and maintaining and re relationships and overseeing his staff of, in New York and Princeton and Los Angeles, he uh, also serves in a non-scientific capacity. He likes to uh, relax as he's the board member of the Asia America Symphony Association, and he's a very avid uh, road cyclist. So please join me in welcoming Robert Pacifici to, to the stage for his talk on accelerating therapeutics for HD. Thanks so much, George, for the nice introduction. Um, it's really such an honor and a privilege uh, to be here and participate in the conference. I'll never forget the first time I came to the HDSA conference. Um, I had actually just joined CHDI, and uh, we were moving from North Carolina, where I was uh, in, in RTP, out to LA. And the scheduling was a little difficult, and so um, basically what happened is we were driving across the country, and I went from uh, Chapel Hill down to Atlanta. I had all my stuff loaded in the car, my two kids, my two dogs, one male, one was in season. It was an interesting trip. Uh, and I hopped out, I came into the hotel, I put on my suit and tie, I gave the talk, hopped in, and uh, went, went the rest of the way. So uh, this time um, I had it a little bit easier. I just had to fly down from Ithaca where um, I participated in my daughter's graduation from Cornell. I'll say a little bit more about that in, in a couple of minutes. So um, I'm here to tell you a little bit about um, uh, CHDI. Um, I'd like to give you a better understanding of what we are and how we operate and uh, maybe how we complement uh, some of the things that uh, Walter just told you about at, at NIH. Um, I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about science. Uh, I am the chief scientific officer and um, I always feel like, you know, it's actually not that complicated. If you just spend some time explaining to people what we're doing, uh, you'll be able to understand it, and I, I think you'll be really jazzed by uh, seeing some of the things that we're doing. I will say up front, um, one of the wonderful problems we have at CHDI is we have this huge portfolio. And so there's no way I can stand up here today and tell you about all the different exciting projects we have. Um, so I just chose a couple uh, as illustrative examples to make a few points, but be rest assured, uh, we're taking multiple shots on goal simultaneously, and um, they're all incredibly high quality. And then um, the last thing, and I think this is the most important thing I can do uh, while I'm here in Baltimore with you, is uh, to really drive home this point that um, we're never going to get to where we all want to be, which is... Uh, robust treatment for Huntington's disease without the participation of uh, families. And I'll give you a couple of examples why. I know a lot of people say that, um, but I think it's intuitive why you want to participate in an interventional trials. Heck, you know, maybe that'll be a treatment and you'll get first crack at it. But maybe what's a little bit less intuitive is why it's so important to participate in all of the other trials, the experimental medicine trials, the registries, et cetera. So um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna hit that pretty hard. And it was only reinforced by a conversation I actually just had five minutes ago um, while I was meeting some of the uh, awardees and, and students. And even they're telling me that part of their work is hampered by uh, the availability of participants in some of these trials. So that's something that we can all do. That's, that's a tangible thing that we can actually fix. All right, so what is CHDI? Exactly. Well, um, 
first and foremost, it's, it's a not-for-profit foundation. Uh, we're funded by incredibly generous private donors, so um, unlike other organizations, we don't really spend any time fundraising. Um, and we have this unbelievable luxury of being motivated by time, not by money. So we don't care what the fifth year peak sales of a treatment for Huntington's is, we care how quickly we can get to that treatment. And as a consequence of being a not-for-profit, we only have collaborators, we have no competitors. So if I say something today that allows some company to go out and find the cure, I'm okay with it, we still win. So uh, we really uh, uh, try and do our best to establish a collaborative network where everybody has what they need uh, to be able to uh, work on Huntington's disease. In fact, um, I would say, you know, it'd be great if the whole world worked on HD. How do we get people to do that? So unlike what you heard from, from Walter, he's got a pretty difficult challenge. I think there were 600 diseases listed on that slide. We've got one, it's HD. That's our singular focus. I know a lot of companies say they're interested in one thing or another. Uh, we're committed to it. We have a fiduciary responsibility uh, to our donors to stay focused on all aspects of HD. And that gives us uh, incredible depth, incredible focus, and incredible passion, because that's the only thing that we eat, live, uh, breathe, and sleep every day. And we've set the bar pretty high. Uh, the mission for CHDI is not a bunt or a single, it's a home run. We're really trying to develop the most meaningful therapies that'll impact the largest number of people in the most significant ways. And the third thing I put up is uh, we're a virtual organization. I put that in quotes. I don't like the word virtual. It sounds like we're fake and we're very real. Um, in fact, there's now 80 people that work for CHDI uh, within the four walls of the foundation across our three sites, uh, Princeton, New Jersey, uh, New York, and LA, where I'm based. And I can tell you, and I'll say this right at the beginning of my talk, I'm the lucky guy who gets to stand up here and tell you uh, about our work and our story and our progress. I am blessed uh, to have uh, a staff uh, that is world class. And you need to know that you've got a team of people that are working tirelessly on your behalf. And uh, we've been unbelievably fortunate in being able to recruit the best and the brightest into the foundation. Um, so we're, we're really lucky to have that team, and I feel really fortunate to be able to represent them um, here today at, at the conference. <laughs> Similar to what uh, Walter said, we really try and cover, uh, and Ed Wilde's going to make fun of me, but I'm going to say it anyway, soup to nuts. Uh, it's everything from blue sky, early discovery work, um, on through translational work, and, uh, and on into the clinic. We actually have uh, a clinical group now that's, uh, that's fully formed within CHDI. And so basically all of the core competencies, whatever we think we need to do drug discovery, we've got a few folks that understand that part of, of the pipeline. And what's more, beyond the folks who are actually employees of the foundation, we support a global network of over 700 people that are working on our behalf. And so the idea is, depending on what we need at any one particular time, how do we reach out and find the company, the contractor, the academic uh, that has exactly the skill set, uh, the technology, the capabilities that we need to push our programs forward? And so it's a highly fungible thing where we can get into and out of areas depending on what's productive and, and what we need. So it's a really, uh, a really great setup. So how do we fit in, into the landscape? There's obviously a lot of players. There's HDSA, there's NIH, there's a, 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 bunch, of, uh, a bunch of entities. And you know, first and foremost, I like to think of ourselves as collaborative enablers. This is part of what I was talking about earlier, of getting everybody to think about and maybe even work on NHD. And you know, let's not mince words. A big part of doing that is to provide funding. Um, so unlike NIH, which provides grants, we do things through contracted agreements, but uh, do fund a significant amount of work in academic labs as, as well. We also want to make sure, uh, back to Walter's theme on tools, that everybody has all of the tools that they need to get the job done. And we want to make sure that they're really good tools, things that we've already quality controlled and we've put uh, a unified nomenclature so that when lab A uses a tool and lab B uses the tool, they both know that they're using the same exact thing and it's of high quality. And when the data is generated, we want everybody to know about that data 
as quickly as possible. We don't want to wait uh, a few years for something to have to go through peer review. We'd like as in real time as possible for everybody to be able to know what each other is doing so that we don't have duplication of efforts and so that if a discovery is made in one place, it can benefit another place as quickly as possible. And so we've put together a bunch of data sharing uh, portals as, as well, including HD and HD, which for the researchers, I encourage you to go and, and, and check it out. And we also do a lot of prospective things that uh, are difficult for, for other players uh, to, to be able to do. So um, hopefully all of you got an Enroll HD hat. Um, CHDI is, uh, is the backer and, and an orchestrator of, of Enroll HD. Incredibly important effort uh, to see if we can get Again, around, uh, around the whole world, um, every family member um, uh, and any person at risk for HD into that database so that we can benefit from uh, characterizing them and getting them involved in, in, in our clinical efforts. Um, we also play a big role in partnering with existing drug discovery companies. You know, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of drug companies and biotechs out there that do an amazing job. And we recognize that maybe left to their own devices, they might not pick Huntington's disease as their top project. Well, a big part of what we do is figure out how do we get them uh, under the tent? How do we get them involved? And in some cases, it's just by providing information. Uh, let us help you design your clinical trial. Uh, let us tell you what we've experienced uh, using particular methods or techniques. In other cases, it's by getting them uh, animal models or, um, uh, or some of our uh, reagents and, and cell lines. And in some cases, it's seeing whether or not we can partner with them to use their existing technology and assets so that um, it's able to lower the barrier of entry. Uh, a great example being the Ionis, now, now Ion, used to be Isis, now Ionis, Ionis Roche collaboration. Uh, those guys, you know, we knew that they had amazing gene silencing uh, technology, and we thought, <clears throat> you know, why, why would we want to invent a new technology? They had it. All they needed was uh, a, a little bit of a push uh, financially and technology into the HD space, and we were happy to catalyze that entry, and uh, you see what's happened since the program has been, you know, tremendously successful. Same kind of thing on the small molecule side. Uh, we became very interested in what's called cyclic nucleotide biology, uh, and we happened to know that the folks at Pfizer had uh, a bunch of compounds, uh, not only in their repositories, but actually in the clinic that modulated cyclic nucleotide biology. And so we uh, got a hold of some of those compounds. They trusted us, and they, they gave those to us. We tested them in a variety of HD-specific experiments, and based on the data that we presented back to Pfizer, they decided that the findings were significantly compelling, that they were willing to take their molecule forward uh, with HD as an indication, and those trials are ongoing now. So I think some, some really great success stories there of being able to partner with companies, not having to reinvent the wheel, uh, and getting to therapeutics much more quickly. There are certain examples, though, where you just <laughs> got to do it yourself. You got to start from scratch. You know, if you're working at a big pharma, and I've worked at a couple of them, you know, you work on something for a while. And if it turns out to be hard, you say, okay, this is really hard. I'm going to work on something else. Well, we don't have that luxury. If we come across a finding, a target, a molecule, and we think it has relevance to HD, we have to prosecute and persist where others may have shied away or um, given up. That's not an option for us. And so we have to have all of those same capabilities that would be found within the pharmaceutical companies at a bunch of contract labs that do the work on, on our behalf. And we've got a wonderful network of, of those that's part of that 700 number uh, that I talked about earlier. And there are hands and brains at the bench, and they do the experiments, and you know, we help with the design and the interpretation of, of the results so that we can discover new molecules that never existed before. And they're ours, meaning they're ours to give away. We take them as far as we need to, to de-risk the program, to make it as enticing as possible for a larger pharmaceutical company or biotech partner to say, hey, we'll take it from here. This looks great. We might never have started this program from scratch, but now that you guys have brought it to this stage, we'd love to test it in the clinic. We'd love to get it out to patients to, to help them. So this has been you know, a, a really gratifying exercise. You know, 
I got to say, like, for me personally, when I left pharma and I told them I was joining a not-for-profit, everybody said, oh, that's, that's nice. <laughs> would, would, would you like my, uh, my recipe for, for chocolate chip cookies for your fundraisers and stuff? And I was like, what are you talking about? I'm like, we're going to do real drug discovery. Uh, and our ability to generate a couple of candidates now from scratch, I think, is, uh, is a tacit demonstration of that capability. So, like, one of the things that uh, everybody in my family does other things. And my mom was a chef, my sister's a teacher, my brother's a shrink, um, a cinematographer on the other side. So, like, I, I spend a lot of time, you know, talking to them. And one of the things that just puzzles them is, like, why is your job so darn hard? You know, like, uh, I mean, yeah, the, the, this is the thing that really kills me. They've heard this expression, you can put a man on the moon, but you can't cure the common cold. Well, yeah, like, um, and, you know, that was done uh, quite, quite a while ago, too. So I, I don't know, some of you maybe are old enough to have remembered the Apollo 13 um, uh, story, and some of you are younger and maybe just saw the movie. But uh, there's this really poignant moment, right, where um, it's, you know, Houston, uh, we have a problem. And uh, basically, you know, as, um, as difficult as their situation was, uh, Tom Hanks, who, who played one of the astronauts in, in the movie, basically pulls out a slide rule, right? That's a precursor to a calculator for those young folks. Um, and he basically makes a, a calculation and fixes the problem, and lo and behold, they're able to calculate their trajectory for reentry and, you know, get, get into the planet. So, yeah, you know, you can put a man on the moon with a slide rule, but, you know, guess what, Baltimore? We have a much bigger problem with HD. It's much more complicated. So, like, that's a one with uh, 23 zeros after it. Uh, that could be any one of a number of things. It could be the number of molecules we could synthesize. It could be the number of transcriptomics results we have. The numbers are huge and staggering, and the problem is unbelievably complex. And so, when you have a big problem, you need a big computer. Um, and so, one of the things that uh, CHGI was able to do recently. I don't know how many of you uh, know about Watson. Uh, it's a, a very big computer, uh, one of the biggest. Uh, it even played Jeopardy and won a chess game. Uh, and it's located uh, at IBM's facility. And so we were able to forge a partnership and say, hey, can you get Watson to read every single scientific paper? And then can we ask Watson some questions about Huntington's disease? Because <laughs> maybe Watson can help us out. And so uh, this is just kicking off now, but I wanted to give you a flavor of uh, some of the things that are happening with, with IBM. So the first one is molecular modeling of hunting tin, the protein itself. And to give you an idea of why this is such a staggering exercise, Watson is, and, and the other computational uh, capabilities at IBM are able to keep track of every single atom in the Huntington molecule weight even more, every single water molecule that's around each amino acid in the Huntington protein and model it dynamically in time and in space and tell us what it is about the shape and movement of the Huntington protein that changes when it has that darn CAG expansion in it, when it has too many polyglutamines in it. And our great hope is that by understanding that change in structure, it'll tell us a change in function, and it'll help answer the question that Walter said, which is, why is it that having that CAG expansion in the gene, those polyglutamines in the protein, is causing this protein to uh, misbehave in a way that causes the disease? So very exciting results there. We're also, yeah. We're also using them in the same way you could build a computer network, um, and I'm happy to hear Walter call this a computer that we're all carrying around. You, can, you have a network in your own brain, and we need to understand how that network is breaking down in Huntington's disease, which connections are being broken, which new connections are being made as compensatory mechanisms. And so uh, there's a whole multi-scale neural modeling program that's ongoing where we're going to try and compare a model, especially the basal ganglial circuits that you talked about earlier, and how they're dysfunctional in, in an HD situation and how we can fix them. And then, you know, we have these reams of data that uh, are thanks to many of you participating in some of the studies that involved sitting in a magnet for hours and getting these magnetic resonance images. Um, and we'd like to understand now, by pumping all of these images into a computer, exactly how those changes happen over time so that we can 
track with a high degree of precision the, the progress of, of the disease, not by um, subjective measures, but by these incredibly objective measures of the organ that we know is most dramatically affected in HD, the brain. So again, very exciting. And then we're also looking at all of the other data that we have on HD subjects. These guys at IBM can predict when somebody is going to have a psychotic episode in other diseases by reading through their emails historically. So just the natural language that people use in, in their emails give them a hint of when something bad is going to happen. And so we're in the process of transferring every last zero and one, every bit of data that we have to IBM so that they can comb through it and see what insights uh, they can pull out for us and tell us what we may already know about the disease. And we're actually thinking about new projects. It doesn't stop here. Things with wearables, Fitbits, and you know, iPhones, and that sort of stuff. And so you'll hear a lot more about this. And I hope uh, by hearing about it here first, you'll be intrigued and maybe would like to participate in some of these things um, as there's a call for uh, patients and families to become involved. So really exciting collaboration with, with IBM. So what do we know for sure about HD? Well, we know there's a population that has it, and if you're one of those people, that's one too many. Um, and it's, uh, it's really, you know, so people now make fun of me because I have to find a way of putting this in every one of my talks, but um, it's so true that I have to read it one more time. There is nothing more valuable to a drug hunter than a robust observation that is made in the population that we seek to treat. So that's me getting an observation from any of you. Because as Walter said, you know, it wasn't until he made that measurement of lactate in a human brain that he even became interested in energetics in, in, in the first place. So those are kernels that we really need to generate and we really need to mine. And I don't want you to take my word for it. I'm gonna give you a couple of examples of how we've already benefited from this. And then I'm gonna tell you about how we wanna really go all in and figure out how we generate more of these insights in the future. So that's a picture of George Huntington. I'm sure you've seen it before. Um, it's interesting, like as a scientist, uh, that, that was his only paper. Uh, it's nice to know you can get famous publishing one paper. Uh, good, good for him. Uh, but you know, basically, that started uh, the, the question and eventually the answer which is, is there a genetic basis for, for Huntington's disease? And sure enough, um, you know, with an awful lot of patient involvement around the world and a bunch of smart people, uh, the gene was cloned. And uh, at first the marker on the short arm of chromosome four and eventually uh, the gene itself. Um, and again, larger numbers, more specific study, we're able to find out that Huntington is not just a simple mutation, it's a, a polymorphism, right? It's this expansion of the CAG uh, re repeats. And so those are two things that were, you know, incredibly informative for the drug discovery community. It's one of the things that's really different than any other neurodegenerative disease, or at least the big ones. There isn't, you know, a single underlying cause of Alzheimer's, right? So even though that's very attractive to the pharmaceutical companies because so many people get Alzheimer's disease, it's not as tractable because you really don't know what's causing it. And so that's a handle that we have in HD that's different from other diseases, and it's a handle we wouldn't have had if it wasn't for the gracious participation of all the families giving those DNA samples. So what do we know is that um, there's a genetic basis. It's in your DNA. And we can connect those two things. We can connect people and say that everyone, sadly, that has, the H, uh, that has HD, it's because you've got the mutated gene. And conversely, uh, everyone that has the mutated gene gets HD. That's what you call complete penetrance, okay? So now we have this hook, and not surprisingly, we tried to leverage it. We tried to figure out you know, what we can do with this gene to enable our drug discovery efforts. And so one of the things that a bunch of investigators did right away is they made a mouse model of HD. Uh, they were able to take this gene and 
in a variety of different ways, stick it into the mouse. And um, we used those mice to develop a really robust industrialized drug screening process. So when I first joined CHDI, there were about 30 credible publications in peer-reviewed journals saying that there were compounds that seemed to make those mice better. So we said, that's great. I was like, you know, this is, this is gonna be an easy job. One of those is gonna work out. And so we made all those compounds and we developed a pipeline for testing them in mice. And we tested over 30 of those compounds at a cost of at least $30 million. I hesitate to look back how much we spent on that exercise. And sadly, none of them panned out as sufficiently positive to recommend them to go forward to clinical trials. So that's kind of bad news and kind of frustrating, certainly was you know, for us. But in retrospect, you know, perhaps trying to recapitulate in total the whole thing, the whole disease, what happens in you know, a big, wrinkly human brain, look at the size of your brain compared to a mouse brain, uh, and what happens over 40 years in just a couple of weeks by putting in a single gene, maybe that was a little bit naive. So it's not so easy. You really have to spend the time and effort and you really have to get down to a high degree of granularity. So I'm not saying that animal models are, are useless, Quite the contrary. In fact, we've made a slime mold, a worm, a fly, a zebrafish, a songbird, a mouse, a rat, a sheep, a pig, a non-human primate. And um, yes, those really all have been made. And no, that's not what an HD sheep looks like. That's just a picture I found in the airport. But um, I haven't met an organism that's happier when it expresses the mutant Huntington gene, um, but it still doesn't tell me whether or not that's reflective of the human pathophysiology. That's too big of a black box, right? So all these animal models are wrong. Some of them are useful. You just have to think about how you're going to use them and what aspect of the disease you're going to model. So I'm gonna to stick to my guns here. I'm still gonna say that there's nothing more valuable to a drug hunter than an observation that's made in the population you seek to treat, but you need a mechanistic hypothesis. So what is that? That's like some scientific mumbo jumbo. Um, you know, the way I, I think of it is, uh, um, you wanna call the plumber. I'm gonna call the plumber. I got, a, I got a problem. I'm gonna call the plumber. Okay, what kind of plumbing problem do you have? You know, if you have a clogged drain, you might wanna bring one of those rotor rooter things. If you got a leaky pipe, you might want to bring some solder and a blowtorch. So it's not enough to say we have a bad gene. It's not enough to say I have a plumbing problem. You have to get down to the details and know specifically what's broken if you're going to try and fix it. So that's been a big push for us in trying to get to that level of detail and granularity. So one mechanistic hypothesis that leverages this observation that you all know about now is that if this is the gene that causes the disease, um, maybe getting rid of that gene would be a good thing. Um, so a bunch of non-clinical work has been done um, and suggests that that's absolutely the case. And this was the genesis for so many of the gene silencing uh, programs that, uh, that you guys are, are, are aware of. So at CHGI, we have these things called major focus areas. Uh, Huntington lowering is the number one priority and is by far the biggest area of investment and, um, and resources. And you know, you don't need to know everything about cell biology. Maybe all you need to know is that there's this gene, it's in the DNA, it makes RNA as an intermediate, it makes protein, and eventually that bad protein causes the disease. And so I see this as an opportunity. Each one of those arrows is another place where you could put your finger in the dike and say, I wanna prevent that protein from being made or I'd like to figure out how I can get that protein away. The way you think about this maybe is kind of like if you're thinking about lowering the level of water in your pool or your bathtub, right? there's two ways of doing that. You can either say, shut off the spigot, I don't wanna put any more water in here, or you can say, open up the drain, you know, and I like to drain out faster. And either one of those is okay if the goal is lowering the level of the water, lowering the level of the Huntington protein. 
And there are a large number, and I apologize for some of the folks who you know, may be here from companies if uh, I've uh, inadvertently omitted them. It's, it's actually a, a growing and encouraging list of very credible companies with very different and complementary approaches uh, that are looking at uh, various ways with various therapeutic modalities at various points in this pathway of lowering the Huntington protein. And um, I think it's great that we have that many shots on goal and that each one of them is uh, unique in its character. When you think about making a drug, you know, one of the ways of, of, of approaching the problem is, is to work your way backwards. So like I'm, as I'm sure you are, picturing like this fantasy day when you get your HD treatment and it comes with that package insert, you know? It comes with that big thing, right? And each one of the sentences in there, my wife writes those package inserts, so I know about those. Um, each one of those sentences is based on uh, a target product profile, something about the drug that says this is how you should administer it, this is the route, or this is how often you should give it, and this is how much you should give it, and these are the side effects you should watch out for, and this is what it's good for, and this is what it's not good for, right? So when I think about a Huntington lowering therapy, um, what is that target product profile? What is the ideal situation? Well, we need to answer some questions, right? Like, what are we trying to target? Uh, do we need to stick only to the mutant gene, or is it okay if we knock down the regular one a little bit, because uh, just about everybody has, uh, with HD has one good copy and, and, and one bad copy of the gene? How much do we need to knock it down? Do we need to get rid of the mutant protein completely, or is just knocking it down a little bit okay, and you know, maybe by knocking it down a little bit, you push the disease out for 20 years, and you know, things are good. Um, how much is too much? What if we knock it down too much, especially if we're touching the normal one? We certainly don't want any bad side effects from our treatments, right? And where do we need to treat? Uh, is it just the caudate and putamen that Dr. Karashets was pointing out? Is it the whole brain? Maybe it's the whole body. You know, we need to figure that out because different drugs and different drug candidates have different distributions and we'll get to different parts of the body, so we want to make sure we're covering the parts that we need to cover. And then when do we need to intervene? Is this something that will only work if you start right from the get-go, uh, in adolescence, uh, when you start having symptoms, after you have symptoms? We need to know what the timing is uh, for these different Huntington-lowering therapies. It's really important. So it turns out that small molecules, the things that are in pills, represented by that crazy compound up there, can actually do all of these things. So if they're designed to do that, if you know what the answers to those questions are, you can say, I'm gonna look for a compound that only targets the mutant Huntington. And I'm gonna look for a compound that is like a rheostat, it's like a volume knob. The more I give, the more it knocks down Huntington. The less I give, the less it knocks down Huntington so I can titrate my dose based on where I'd like to be. And a small molecule, most of them, especially if you design them right, they can get everywhere all the time. So you take it by mouth and then like a drop of ink in a gallon jug of water, everything becomes a little blue after a while. And so you'd like for the thing to distribute everywhere um, if it's designed to do that and if it's needed to do that. And when to intervene, well, that's the beauty of having a pill, right? You can start anytime, you can stop anytime. You design it to be safe and well tolerated, you can start treatments earlier and earlier. So I want to be clear, I have every confidence in the candidates that are in the clinic right now. I just don't think we have the luxury of waiting given how long it takes to do drug discovery. And so to be proactive and to get out in front of this problem, we're thinking about generating this small molecule uh, lowering agent for Huntington, and it's one of the programs that we're driving at CHDI because we're so confident of the link of that particular protein to this particular disease, of the mechanism of action. So here's that same pathway again from gene to protein, and what we've done, and I just want to give you a little bit of a sense of the different steps that we take along the way. So this has been done before. People have tried this, but, you know, we keep on improving. As Walter said, we get better tools. So we've got better cells now. Those iPSCs that he was talking about, we're not gonna screen in some rat pheochromocytoma anymore. We're gonna screen in cells that look like HD patients because they're from HD patients. 
They have the same CAGs that most people do. We differentiate them into the right type of neuron, and so we have the best mimic in a Petri dish of what we think is happening inside affected individuals. And we have better compounds. We have access to all the approved drugs. We have access to huge libraries of drug-like molecules, and so we're gonna start with the ones that we think have the best chance, but we're gonna keep going, throw the kitchen sink at it until we find the compounds that we need. So I'm an old high-throughput screening guy, and you know, the, the, the metaphor is how do you find a needle in a haystack? What if we start with a million compounds? How do you find that one special one? Well, you keep on taking the pitchfork and you keep on removing little by little things that you know are no good. So the first thing you do is you ask the big question, can the compound lower mutant Huntington and does it also lower normal Huntington? And maybe the way it does those things is by killing the cells, that wouldn't be so good, right? So we've got these wonderful tools in the lab where we've got antibodies that bind onto the Huntington protein and when they do, they make light. And so the more light, the more Huntington protein, the less light, the less Huntington protein, and we can do millions of those experiments in months. And then we can plot the results and we can look for the compounds that fit that profile. A compound that lowers mutant Huntington at one concentration and it's not until way higher concentrations that it touches the normal protein or kills the cell. If we get those, we wanna know that it's real. Is it reproducible? So we test it again and again and again and we wanna make sure that we get the same result. So if you test the compound once and then test it again, and you plot those results, it should be a straight line, right? It should be a cloud around a straight line that says, I tested this one time, tested another time, gives this result. These are real results from the initial screen of the Huntington lowering program. They're, as a high throughput screener, that puts a big smile on my face. That's exactly what we want to see, not only in terms of the concordance from one run to another, but those green ones on the upper right, because those are the ones that are starting to do the job. Those are the ones that made it through that first gate. So then we get even more picky. Like, you know, we really want to make sure that we're not BSing ourselves here, right? Like, can we confirm that the structure that we saw on the computer screen is really what's in the well? And so we get, we make it again from scratch and confirm that that's really the structure. And then we ask, does it lower other proteins? So, you know, of course we're gonna start with Huntington, that's the thing that we're interested in. But we look at other housekeeping genes, for example, make sure that they're okay. And then we really wanna know, does it work in other cells? So what do I mean by other cells? Well, does it work in different cell types? So we can take those iPSCs and we can make them into different cell types and ask the question in a Petri dish, do we think this might work in all parts of the brain? Do we think it might work in the liver? Um, and we also don't want to, you know, the, 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 the primary screening campaign is done with cells from one or two individuals. Well, we wouldn't want to come up with a treatment that just helps one or two individuals. We want to come up with a treatment that helps everybody. And so one of the things that we do is once we've got those compounds, we start making cells from a bunch of other individuals and we say, yes, this is something that really will work in a large population because every cell that we throw at it seems to be responsive to the compound. And then we want to make that black box smaller and smaller. We really want to understand where the compound is working. Ideally, you know, you, you think of a compound as a lock and key mechanism. We want to take that key that we've got now and figure out exactly which lock is it pushing into, exactly how does this thing lower Huntington because that's something that we need to be able to understand as we develop what's called, you know, the, the translational path for it, how we take it from the bench top to the bedside. And so we look at the different parts and figure out, is it turning on the spigot, turning off the spigot? Is it opening up the drain? And then we need to figure out also if we can modify the compound. You don't get a drug out of a high throughput screen. There's usually about 200 more steps of modifying that molecule, adding an atom here, taking an atom away there. And so we need to know that we can tweak this and think of like adding Lego blocks and taking stuff on and putting different colors on and off. We need to know that um, as we try and hone this molecule to have the 20 some properties that are necessary to make it into a drug, that we can measure that along the way. So this is a great 
program. We're really excited about it. As you can see, it's already underway. Um, in about a year's time, I hope to report back uh, with candidate molecules and how they're doing in, 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 in vivo. Um, so incredibly exciting times on the Huntington lowering front. So I want to just give two other quick examples, and then I won't run too far over, hopefully. This is another example of how the patients have helped us, and Walter alluded to this. So we know that there's this inverse correlation between CAG and age of onset, right? So all that means is the bigger your CAG, chances are um, the earlier you get the disease and, and, and vice versa. But whenever you see one of these plots, one of the things that people sort of don't talk a lot about is this pink stuff, which is those are error bars. What that means is that there are some people who have 40 CAGs, and sadly, they get the disease at 20 years old. Now, the average may be 40 or 45, but there are some people who get it when they're 60. And so these outliers are incredibly valuable. What this is telling us, the human biology is telling us that there are other heritable components, other genes that can dramatically affect the age of onset, how quickly this disease exerts its deleterious effects. And as Walter said, to be able to leverage this, if I could make a compound that delays the disease by 40 years, that would be a huge home run. So the first step in doing this is finding those other genes. And you do this in what's loosely called a systems approach. And the paper that Walter alluded to earlier is here again. What you can see is they call these Manhattan plots. Kind of looks like the skyline in Manhattan. Uh, I'm a New Yorker, sorry. Um, and what you can see is that you're looking for a spot on a chromosome that points to a locus and eventually will point to a gene that makes it above that line, that gets you above the horizon, that sticks out of the skyline. And it wasn't until 5,000 people participated in genome-wide association studies that we were finally able to get significance of the result. So it gives you a sense of, you know, not only how important participation is in terms of informing our efforts, we're now going to get a gene that we know modifies HD, but how many people need to become in involved in order to be able to get to the actual candidates. So this is a really landmark finding. I'd say this is the most important thing that's happened in HD genetics since the cloning of the gene itself, and look forward to identifying that gene and uh, getting a compound, hopefully, that modulates it. So there are all kinds of ways of connecting the dots between the DNA and the people and the population. And Maybe this is my version of those stones that you talked about, Walter. They're all these different levels, right? We got, the, we got a couple of examples now at the DNA level. We're going to continue to walk our way up this staircase and down this staircase to continue to understand the disease at each one of these levels so that we can really understand more about HD with high degree of granularity and precision. And that means that we need to observe you. We need phenotypic measures uh, that are part of many of these trials. We need samples. We need cerebrospinal fluid. We need DNA. We need cells, right? That's what gives us this molecular layer. And then a bunch of stuff in between to query specific mechanisms. And I realize, like, these aren't easy things to ask for. Okay, you got to sit in a magnet for an hour. You got to put on one of these crazy shower caps with all kinds of wires sticking out. But trust me, the information we get out of there can't get it anywhere else. It's invaluable. And I promise that when we come up with conclusive results from those, we'll leverage them to figure out how we can make better rational treatments. And what's more, come up with shorter term endpoints for clinical trials. I don't want to have to start a clinical trial, no matter how much I believe in a compound, and hope that by getting dozens of people involved for several years, that somehow at the end of it, I'm going to move a super score a couple of points. 
What I want to know is after a couple of weeks or a couple of months that the compound is doing the thing that I think it should do, then I'm willing to wait for the big clinically meaningful result. And a mechanism tying the compound to a target, to a patient, is the only way to do that. And so one of the things you'll see is a bunch of these studies, whether they're registries or specific experimental medicine studies that will be coming your way. Some of them are underway already, HD Clarity, iMark HD, other ones that don't have a fancy logo yet, and I don't know if that's going to be their name. But when you hear these things, hopefully they'll resonate with you and you'll know why they're so important. So I really want to applaud um, HDSA because they're our interface to the community. And their trial finder efforts and their human biology program are uh, really going to be tremendously helpful. And so we look forward to partnering with them um, in terms of you know, getting all of you uh, involved and enrolled. So I, I just want to say one other thing before I, I close. Um, you know, so many of you have been so generous in sharing your family stories and what you're going through. I mentioned at the top of the presentation that I just got back from my daughter's graduation at Cornell. Um, she decided to go there because my dad went there. That's a picture of him uh, back in 1940. So it turns out there's a genetic disease that runs in my family. It's even more rare than Huntington's disease. It's called FMF. And that's right around the time my dad started getting really sick. Um, turns out he got so sick he couldn't finish. Cornell had to return back home. And um, he eventually died at 47. So when I went back up for my daughter's graduation, we found the spot. And you can imagine how proud I was to see her standing in the same spot. So she doesn't have the FMF gene, thank God. Um, so she was able to have a healthy time at, at Cornell. The thing that's I'm really looking forward to next year is my son, who's also there, who does have the FMF gene, but thanks to some wonderful work back in the 70s, a treatment for FMF was identified, and both he and I have been taking it ever since. And he's going to be able to complete you know, Cornell next year thanks to the efforts of uh, a bunch of really smart scientists and drug hunters. So um, I would love nothing more than to be able to pay it forward and contribute in some way to that same story in, in HD. So I hope I've given you a better understanding of CHDI. <laughs> maybe the three objectives, maybe a little bit of hope in there as well. So thanks, everybody, for your attention. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Robert. How about just one more round of applause for Walter and Robert for really great presentations.